outperform other students. And so this program received, uh, and you can see, had an additional $8.9 million. Now, some of us in education have said that this is the right idea. And by the way, this program came into existence almost 30 years ago. And so some of us have said that we need to figure out how we can have a higher education opportunity program in our high schools, right? Just think, because you know, you do know we, we have a graduation rate where um, large segments of our population are not graduating. And it's not because there's, any, there's something wrong with that. What, what's wrong is the way in which we manage the budget and the way we allocate funding. So what this suggests is that if we could put the money in the right place, more youngsters would do well. So moving right along, um, the next area, and I don't know my colleague may want to weigh in, in on this, Dr. Cashman, uh, I talked about struggling schools. Uh, the governor also came up with this strategy. He said, we've got to do something about the struggling schools. And all of you probably heard the sound bite. He, somebody got on television and said, how could we have all these children who are failing and none of the teachers are, are being rated unsatisfactory? I mean, that was the sound. And then he said that we've got to do something about these schools because we've got schools that have been low performing for 20 years and nothing has happened. And so we need to do something about it. And it's very interesting what they're proposing, or at least what was passed in the budget. And everyone needs to get real focused on why the budget is important. They passed something called receivership. Um, I'm not gonna, uh, you know, I'm debating whether I should use what, what I think receivership is, but a, a re they, they instituted something called a receivership. And the receivership has two components. Component number one, in year one, the, the superintendent of the district becomes the receiver. If the superintendent doesn't produce improvement in those schools, then they have to select what's called an independent receiver. And the independent receiver can be an individual, it could be a not-for-profit, it could be a school district, or it could be some other entity. Now, there are those that have hypothesized that the direction of public education is going in a, in a different place and that there, there is this move away from public education. And because we're in, in the community, um, I think it's important for us to understand that in the se there are 700 districts in the state of New York. There are districts that don't have any of these problems. They don't have charters, they don't have receivers, they don't have any of this. And they have wonderful schools. And so one of, the, one of the questions that we've got to begin to ask ourselves is if these strategies that they impose on this community and communities like this work so well, why are they only in these communities? Why aren't they done universally throughout the state? And these are important questions that we have to ask. So I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time with the receiver, but it, and I want you to see what the power of the school receiver um, they, can, they can make changes in the school's budget. They don't need anyone's permission. They can just come in and make changes in the budget. Um, they can change the school program and the curriculum, meaning they can decide what children learn. They can require all staff in the school to reapply for their position. Um, they can expand the school day and the school year. 
They can convert, they have the power to convert the school to a charter school. And they can request changes in the collective bargaining agreement. So the receiver is a very powerful person, right? And they can do a lot of different things, including convert um, the school to a charter. And I guess this is the important thing to know, that in Brooklyn, these are the Brooklyn districts, and you can see these are the schools. This is the tentative list of schools. I didn't identify the schools, we just identified the districts and the number. And so you, you know, I know everyone now is looking, where's my district and how many schools? Mm -hmm. But that's what, so you can see, so if you go across, persistently struggling means that they've been struggling for a long time. Right. So you can see uh, they have persistently struggling, there are two of those schools, and then there are struggling schools. There are 15 for a total of 17 in Brooklyn. But that's the preliminary list. It's, it's not based, that's based on the 2014 data. It's not based on the 2015 data. No district 15 there. Um, I, we don't need to go through the timeline. Uh, however, I would just caution everyone that when you think about the budget, um, and so next year, when we get into this process, um, we should really begin to ask ourselves, what do we really need, at least in terms of education? What are the supports that we need in, this, in our schools? And then what do we have to do as a community to ensure that we get those supports? So the last thing that is here is the business on the teacher evaluation. Uh, Dr. Gasser, would you like to? <laughs> sure, Mr. Anderson. <laughs> 